day, the holy 50 days of the resurrection feast. Um, and as we said before, we go through uh, different passages from the gospel according to St. John, um, not only on the Sundays, but most, um, or the majority, I should say, of, of um, the gospels of all of the 50 days um, of the resurrection. <clears throat> and there's many important aspects of the gospel today. Uh, the Lord says one of the most powerful I am statements, which is, I am the bread of life, right? And we've read this gospel um, actually other times during the year, like in the blessed month of Amshir, for example. Um, so we should be familiar with it. And we know this chapter, chapter 6, is primarily focused on the Holy Communion um, after he feeds the multitudes um, with the five loaves and two fish. They come looking for him and he begins to explain to them the importance of how he doesn't just give the bread of the world, but more importantly, himself as the bread of life. <clears throat> and during this time, some people seem to feel a little um, sad or disappointed that Passion Week is over, right? Of course, regarding uh, fasting, probably not. But when it comes to the spiritual life, um, and this, this is pretty common, like even St. John Chrysostom, hundreds of years ago, um, said the same thing. Uh, he, he, um, he wants us to not prioritize one liturgy over another, right? So he says, the mystery at Vascha has nothing more than, than which is now celebrated. It is one and the same, right? He's saying there is the same grace of the Spirit. Um, it is always Vascha, as he says, for as often as you eat eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until it comes. So he says later, let no one therefore commune in one way then and in another way now. There is at all times the same power, the same dignity, the same grace, one and the same flesh, one and the same body, nor is it more holy at one time and less holy at another. So this is the importance of recognizing the power and the grace and the blessing of the mysteries, especially that of the Holy Eucharist, um, regardless of the day or that we celebrate in the church. <clears throat> and then he says, the only difference was that, he says, the only thing that those days have more is from them began the day of our salvation that Christ was sacrificed then. But with respect to these mysteries, those days have no superiority. Um, so I think that's something just to keep in mind um, when even with, within the week, like, like for example, Sunday is the Lord's day, um, and we should come to the church and partake as, as we are doing now. Um, but someone would say, well, I already partook of the communion on Sunday. I, I shouldn't go. I don't need to go another day. Um, that's that's the, the wrong understanding of, of the holy mysteries. Um, so we'll go deeper into the concept of the bread of life. But before that, I just wanted to um, explain a little bit about the symbolism um, for the bread in, in the scripture or more specifically the yeast, right? There's actually two different um, explanations. For example, some people, um, especially during the pa Passion Week, um, they understand it was during the time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover and remo removing the leaven, right? So then they say, well, how come in the Orthodox Church we have leavened bread? What is our response as Orthodox? We don't necessarily say it is wrong for, for those other Christians who, who have unleavened bread in, in their Eucharist. Um, they have a good reason for it, um, and we have a good reason for why we put leaven. So whether you put leaven or unleavened, it depends on the reason. <laughs> right? And so there's two good theological reasons, um, even in Scripture, that explain um, what the yeast symbolizes. Anyone know? Christ himself gave an explanation to his disciples when he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, right? And this is a negative um, connotation of what the leaven, and, and that also has to do with Passover, removing the, 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 the yeast from the house or from our life. I think we, one of the um, visitors we had a 
explaining it's explained it during Basra. So it refers to what? Sin, right? Um, and so that's why some other Christians say, okay, Christ is without sin. Yes, he is, right? And we should remove the sin as much as we can by his grace and by life of repentance before we partake of the holy bread. Um, so, of course, we as Orthodox don't, don't use that explanation um, of course, because Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, right? So, and he who knew no sin became sin for us, right? Because he took it upon himself. So that's one reason why in our church we put yeast, right? What is the other reason? Well, another one might be historically because the Lord celebrated the Passover with his disciples early. Um, why on Thursday? Because on the day of the, the Passover, Christ himself was sacrificed, right? <clears throat> so, but the second probably more important reason why um, we infuse yeast into the holy bread is why. Because it reminds us of how God infuses life into us. So this is a symbol of the resurrection. Um, <clears throat> and so um, one um, Orthodox writer um, writes, uh, God's life is infused into the present age and mingled with it without change or confusion through the mysteries. God touches, purifies, illumines, sanctifies, and and, and blesses or deifies human life in his uncreated divine energies. <clears throat> and then later on he says, um, thus the mysteries become the very, or sacraments, become the various manifestations of our Lord's saving power and the means by which Christ is present and works in his church. So God works in his church through the, through the sacraments and through the work of the Holy Spirit manifest in power. Um, and that's how we should look at the sacraments, <clears throat> the mysteries. Okay, so that, that's just a, a side note. So going back to that concept today when the Lord says, I am the bread of life, he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Of course, he's talking about the spiritual hunger, not necessarily the, the physical. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the fa famous uh, phrase that was probably taken from a German philosopher uh, a few hundred years ago when he says, a man is what he eats. Right? Without knowing it, as one Orthodox um, priest writes, he was expressing the most deepest religious idea of man. Okay, um, So man eats to live, and he lives to eat. And out of his hunger for food, um, but also his, out of his hunger for life, God placed in us a hunger for, for not just food, but for himself. Right? <clears throat> and that's why he tells um, the, the people in the same chapter, um, do not labor for the food which perishes. So you work to get some money to get food so you can eat, right? So, but he says, more importantly, what's more important? The bread that, that we eat or the holy bread? Of course, the holy bread, right? <clears throat> so we have to labor for that one as well. It says, um, we also discussed during Passion Week um, the idea of before the cross, uh, we were dead, right? Even living, the, the end of the life in this world was death, right? And even what we consume is death. It's dead, right? Um, and we go from one state, in a sense, of death to another, just kind of like when we cut off a flower, right? It's severed from the life-giving source. And although it looks beautiful for a time, it's just a matter of time before it dies, right? Um, <clears throat> same thing with... The, what the Lord was saying, the labor, do not labor for the food which perishes. But after the cross and the resurrection, life had a whole new meaning. And it was not life leading to death, but life through death leaving, leading to a new life. Um, and that's how we see even death. It's just a doorway or a pathway to the, the holy resurrection and new life with the Lord. <clears throat> And so when we partake of the holy body and the precious blood of the Lord, right, that gives life, in a sense, we can say that we are eating of the resurrection. We are partaking of the power and the grace and the blessing and the new life that God has prepared for us. Um, and that's why the Lord said so many important aspects of, of the, the Holy Communion or himself being the bread of life. Okay. Um, 
And because if that were not the case, um, like St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he gives his most uh, beautiful explanation or one of the most beautiful explanations about the Holy Resurrection in Scripture, right? And, and then he gives um, a scenario, well, what if Christ didn't rise, right? Then everything is pointless that we are doing and we're still in our sins, right? Um, <clears throat> and if Christ didn't rise, like we can continue that, then, then even taking um, the, the bread in the church or taking of his body and of his blood, if, if that is still true, but Christ didn't rise, then um, we would be accused uh, back in the early days um, of the church. Uh, the Christians were misunderstood um, as if they were, you know, being cannibalistic. And um, they, they heard of the Eucharistic meal and they didn't understand. They heard of the Agave meal, they didn't understand. So they started spreading a lot of rumors. And then the early um, apologists um, helped explain um, what the Christianity was about, right? But if Christ died and the end of story and we partake of his body and blood now, then we're just eating more death, right? We're consuming more death. But because he rose from the dead and he is the source of life, then there's a newness that happens when we partake of the gifts and of the great mysteries. <clears throat> so Eucharist um, or, or the Holy Communion becomes a, a filling station, an opportunity for us to grow and to be filled um, and, to, and to be empowered, right? We fill our minds with knowledge and wisdom. We fill our hearts with joy and peace and, and, and love, right? <clears throat> one, of, uh, one Orthodox theologian expresses the Eucharist as the fulfillment of the blessing of the promise that was mentioned in Matthew 25 when, um, when the, the parable of the talents, when, when after the Lord came or the master came to reward the, the faithful servants, when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, um, you were faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler of many things. And then what does he say? Enter into the joy of your Lord, right? Um, beautiful statement. <clears throat> and so one Orthodox theologian says, when, when he says, enter into the joy of the Lord, what is the joy of the Lord? That's the Eucharist. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Um, uh, another interesting fact is when, um, when a priest is ordained, um, before the holy altar uh, and the bishop lays his hands on him and, and after, after the consecrating prayers um, <clears throat> he, gra he grabs him by the hand and, and escorts him into the altar and he says the same, same words enter into the joy of the Lord and probably the same thing will happen to each and every one of us when we leave this world and enter into the paradise we will hear the, the, joy, the joyful verse saying enter into the joy so this is what the Eucharist shows to us. And this is how we should feel when we partake of the holy uh, mysteries. <clears throat> and so the Lord is removing sorrow from our hearts. He is removing the anxiety and the worry. And he's granting us the love and the joy and the peace. Um, this is the blessing of, of the Holy Eucharist. <clears throat> um, so um, like we said, this is the, the infused life that grants us uh, power. So... Some people will ask, well, how do we benefit more from the divine liturgy? Um, and I, I use the example, well, it's similar to being successful at school or at work, right? What are some things that we, we tell students um, or employees how to be a better, uh, how to be better at your, your job, right? So if we consider being a Eucharistic being, like one, one Orthodox theologian, theologian says, man, is designed to be a Eucharistic doxological being, meaning um, one who gives thanks to the Lord and lives in the church with, with the mysteries and the sacraments and gives glory to God, the doxology. <clears throat> so how could we be better at that, right? How could we, be, how could we benefit more when, we, when we're here, right? Um, <clears throat> so, same, so same thing applies like to work, right? If you have an employee and you say, how, how can you be a better employee? How can you be a better sir? Well, come early uh, or on time at least, right? You, you come up in the front. You limit yourself from distractions. You pay attention when it's time. Like when the deacon says, gross comment, let us attend. That just means you know, focus, right? Um, be honest with yourself, right? Participate as best as you can. 
um, stand when it's time to stand, bow when it's time to stand, sing when it's time to sing. This participation helps get you yourself get involved, not only physically, but spiritually. There's the connection here. Um, do your homework. What is that? Well, if you want to benefit from praying in the liturgy, then pray at home, right? The, the homework of getting closer to God when you're outside of the church has a great impact when you come into the church and vice versa. They both have impact on each other, right? Um, ask for help when you need it, right? So, um, of course, not during, right? But um, whether it's in, in books or advice or, or um, discuss in, discussion with your father confession or whatever it might be, that, that helps um, create a bigger impact on you spiritually, not necessarily emotionally, because emotions are, are not always necessarily the proper um, gauge to measure our spirituality, because they come and go, and they go up and down. Um, <clears throat> um, and the last one is just to prepare better, to prepare for Holy Communion. Um, there's a lot of different aspects of this preparation, like, right, there's the physical, um, not eating food and drink. Like, we all, all know this um, aspect. There's the relational, like um, the Lord says, before you partake um, or you offer your gifts, make sure, um, he says, if, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift, go be reconciled with your brother, um, and then come and, and offer your gift. So if there's anything that I could do to help, in, in that reconciliation before. That's why um, we have a reminder of that in the liturgy. We didn't do it yet, but anyone remember? It's right after the reconciliation prayer, right? Um, so we're talking about God's reconciling us. So we greet one another with a holy kiss in remembrance that um, we, we, we have nothing against our brother. Uh, even if they're upset at us, we, we've done everything in our power, as much as it depends on us, to be at peace with them. <clears throat> and then, um, so that's the, in a sense, the relational um, preparation. There's the mental preparation, um, the understanding. Like St. Paul says, I will pray with the Spirit, I will pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, I will sing with understanding. So with understanding comes study, right? Whether we study um, the scriptures or we study ourselves in preparation in, in, in the spirit of repentance, or we study the liturgy and, and, and the different prayers that we might not be familiar with. Um, because the more we study, the more we realize, the more we don't know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then the last one is the spiritual preparation, of course, which is the most important, um, which has to do with living in, in, in the life of holiness as much as we can. Um, and sometimes we overlook the big things when we come to the Lord because we think there is no problem with it or that this is just who I am, right? So if we're, if we're dealing with a specific sin or issue in our life, we have to reveal it to, to God in prayer. We have to reveal it to our Father of Confession um, so that we, we get direction and guidance. Some people won't say anything and they'll make the judgment call of whether or not I should take communion or not. It's very dangerous. Um, either extreme is very dangerous because you say, oh, I'm a sinner, I don't deserve it. Well, go to your father of confession and, tell, and, and let him tell you if, if you should take communion or not. Um, or it's not a big deal, um, everyone does it. No, go to your father of confession and, and, and hear from, from, um, from the mouth of the Holy Spirit if, if you should partake of the, the, the holy mysteries or not. So don't put that burden on yourself. Um, <clears throat> Because unfortunately, there's a lot of people that might be living in, in sin or living in a, a certain lifestyle that is not appropriate by the scriptures or, or by the, the, the rules of the church, which are based on scripture. Um, it's, it's very dangerous to, to be okay with certain things and, and, and to think um, you're, you're worthy to partake of the mysteries. Um, <clears throat> uh, God, God forbid that happened to us. Um, like St. Paul says, if that's the case, then that person brings condemnation to themselves rather than blessing. Um, <clears throat> so may God protect us uh, from that. So, um, and to conclude, right, the Lord Jesus Christ is the bread of life who, who gives us a taste of eternity, not only after we leave this world, but now. Um, and, and that has power to forgive sin. 
It has power for us to grow and to keep the life of holiness as best, best as we can. But we have to, we have to do our part, um, whether it's mentally with learning, whether it's relationally with, with um, uh, reconciling ourselves to others, um, or whether it's spiritually in growing in the life of holiness. May the Lord always give us this grace for us on the altar until we hear that joyful voice saying, enter into the joy of the Lord. Glory be to him now and to the age of